Good morning again, and welcome now to another online worship service. So wonderful to be with you in this way. I pray this week that God will bless you abundantly and that uh, we will be united together in this online worship service. And so that is my prayer today, and do just welcome you now for worship. Our God, we meet in your name and presence. We invite you among us. We claim your promise to meet with all those who call upon you. Because we meet together today, may life be enlarged for those who lack hope. May life be clarified for those confused. May life be sweeter for those who taste the bitterness of it. May life be holy for those who may have lost dignity, beauty, and the meaning of it. Amen. And now the text for today is Matthew 15, 10 through 28. Hear now the word of the Lord. Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Then he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you want something bad enough, you will do whatever it takes to get it. I was never a good fundraiser when I was in public school. I don't know if they still do this to children in school, but they would send us home with the world's best chocolate bars. And we were supposed to sell them to raise money for whatever. We would sell chocolate, have people sign up to sponsor us for a walkathon, or purchase wrapping paper from a catalog. Regardless of what we were supposed to be selling and collecting money for, I was never any good at it. The prizes, though, were always amazing to me. I remember one of them, we would have been able to take a ride in a limo to eat lunch at like a Pizza Hut or something. But we had to sell a hundred chocolate bars or so to get to participate in that. I was always jealous of the kids who were successful at doing the fundraiser because despite my desire to ride in the limo, it must not have been a great enough desire to knock on a thousand doors in order to sell those 100 chocolate bars. In high school, our football team did a fundraiser and I was on the team and so my teammates and I had to sell these coupon cards for like $10 each. 
the coupon card promise a thousand dollars worth of savings but as you probably know to save that one thousand dollars you would have had to spend a whole lot more than that nevertheless we did this fundraiser in a single day they called it a blitz and we had eight hours to sell these cards the players who had cars would drive the players who didn't have cars, and we went all over the community knocking on doors to sell these wonderful coupon cards. Like I said, I have never been good at this kind of thing, but something was different this time. We were told that if we sold just 25 of these cards, the fundraising company would give us a gym bag with our name and our football number and the team logo on it. I cannot tell you why, but I wanted that bag. I wanted it so bad that I did everything in my power that day to sell those 25 cards. My little group and I knocked on hundreds of doors. We ran from dogs who chased us in neighborhoods, got screamed at for waking people up. And at the end of the day, I had sold 25 cards. I loved that bag. And I used it everywhere I went. Sabrina, my wife, eventually made me throw it out because it smelled so bad. But I never wanted anything more than that ridiculous bag. I could have probably just done that many hours of work for my parents and they would have just bought me a same cheap bag and have my name put on it. But something about getting one that day spoke to my spirit like nothing had ever done before. Today, we are engaging with one of the most difficult passages, I think, in the Bible. There are a handful of passages in the Bible that I think we could talk about for days, for the rest of time, and still feel like we have not fully dealt with the text. I chose this passage for today, firstly, because it is the gospel text for today, according to to the planner that we follow, but I also chose it because I have personally wrestled with this passage for years. I went back in my files to see when the last time this text popped up and I found the last Sunday that this text had previously been in the planner and my records showed me that I chose a different text for that day. We talked about this passage a lot in school while we tried to continue to paint a more complete image of who Jesus is, both historically and theologically, to explore what it means that Jesus was both a man living in first century Israel and the God who created the very ground we walk on. You see, this morning, we are dealing with a difficult part of our faith, and that is trying to understand Jesus as a man who flipped tables because he was furious, a man who wept when his friend died, a man who loved to eat with his neighbors, and at the same time trying to understand Jesus as fully God, who was willing to die on a cross and was resurrected for the redemption of all of creation. We say in our creed every Sunday that Jesus was born to the Virgin Mary, just like every woman and man. But in that same creed, we say Jesus sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. In this passage, arguably more than any other, we see this tension so clearly in this person of Jesus as being both fully God and fully human, fully a man. We see how culture and time impacts the son of Mary and Joseph, the son of God. It's so important, I think, in this passage to understand that one of the greatest challenges that faced the early church was the relationship between Jewish followers of Jesus and Gentile, non-Jewish followers of Jesus. So much of the Gospels and Paul's letters and the New Testament in general were written to address how in the world these two groups of people can exist together. 
that on both sides of the table there are things that are essential to their identity. That for first century Jewish people, things like circumcision and food laws and the Sabbath and other laws handed down through the generations of tradition, how do our new Gentile, our new non-Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob without adhering at least in some way to the laws found in the first five books of the Bible. Likewise, the Gentile Christians living in the Roman Empire have been participating in their civic duties by attending social events at temples dedicated to Roman gods, eating food that was served in those temples. For some of the Gentiles, these gatherings were important to their livelihood because as Roman citizens, their job and part of their responsibility was to participate in civic duty. It was expected. And civic duty for a Roman citizen might mean having to share a meal that had been previously sacrificed to other gods. I hope you are seeing just how complicated and messy these new relationships between two totally different groups of people truly were. That racially and socially, these two groups of people have totally different worldviews and experiences, but because of Christ, they're called to sit at the same table. Well, just how is that going to work? In the passage, we see Jesus dealing with these kinds of questions by addressing even an internal conversation between the Jewish people in the first century Israel area. They're addressing Jesus's what is clean and unclean. Matthew says, do you not know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? The Pharisees are some of the religious leaders of the Jewish faith during Jesus's time and have drawn issue with Jesus' claim that it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Essentially, there is the issue is, is that there is a long-standing tradition in first century Judaism that has been handed down for generations that faithful Jews should go through a ritual cleansing before having their meal. That earlier in the chapter, this debacle begins with the Pharisees asking Jesus, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. In the verses we read this morning, Jesus explains his interpretation of what makes a person clean or unclean by saying, Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth proceeds? enters the stomach and goes into the sewer, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and that's what defiles. So Jesus is saying in this passage that it's the heart that stands to be clean or defiled, not because of whether one goes through a ritual cleansing process before they eat, but based on how they exist in relationship to God and neighbor. That Jesus names a few of the Ten Commandments in the kinds of things that defile murder, theft, slander, adultery, so on. Jesus says these are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. I know that might feel very historical and detailed, but I want us to see just how messy and difficult the relations are, even within the Jewish people during the first century, but also how messy and difficult they are between the Jewish people as a whole and the Gentile people as we move to an even more difficult part of the passage for us to understand. As the passage moves forward, Jesus enters the Gentile territories of Tyre and Sidon. It is while Jesus is in the Gentile land that who else but a Gentile woman would come to Jesus with a request. We must understand that this woman walking up and even talking to Jesus is offensive in the Middle East in the first century. Jewish people in the first century and Gentiles, they don't mix, period. 
And let's be extra clear here, because the woman has not only come up to this Jewish rabbi named Jesus, but Matthew says she is shouting. She shouts, screams, Lord, son of David, my daughter is tormented by a demon. I'm not a mother, clearly, but I have a mother. And I know my mother would have done anything she thought would help her child in a dire situation. If there was word that someone was nearby that could help my mother's tormented child, she would not care what barrier stood between her and that person. This mother apparently has heard that a woman simply touched this man's cloak and was made well, that this man has been traveling all around, healing people left and right. Like most of the mothers I know, this woman doesn't seem to care what is socially appropriate because her child is hurting and she believes this man can help. What's so painfully difficult, though, about this passage begins with the next verse. The Canaanite woman shouts, have mercy on me. My daughter is tormented by a demon. And Matthew says, but he did not answer her at all. And despite Jesus essentially ignoring this woman, she continues to shout. She's apparently so persistent in her shouting that she has so bothered to the disciples to say to Jesus send her away for she keeps shouting at us Jesus finally speaks but it's not with words of healing at least not yet Jesus says I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel meaning Jesus's ministry is currently exclusive to the Jewish people. That there will perhaps come a time when this Jesus' work will be extended through the Jewish people and to the rest of the world, but according to Jesus on this day, that day is not today. But like most of the mothers I know, she persists. The mother kneels before Jesus and says, Lord, Help me. Help me. And before it gets better, Jesus resists again by saying, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Jesus is saying that his ministry, this gospel message, this food, is for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. At the moment, not for you Gentiles, you dogs. I love my own mother very much. And I can't imagine what this mother must be feeling at this point. But despite being ignored, the disciples demanding that Jesus send her away, Jesus himself even resisting her, this mother persists. She wanted this bad enough, and she was going to do whatever it took to get her daughter healed. Jesus says, this food, my ministry, is for the children, not the dogs. But the mother says, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Just think about how humble and clever that response truly is. Even the dogs get to eat the tiny morsels of bread that fall from the children's hands as they eat. Jesus is apparently so moved by this woman's persistence that he finally says, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And Matthew says her daughter was healed instantly. You see, we live with this tension 
in Jesus as being both a man and God that this is what it means when we say Jesus knows what it means to be human because Jesus was a human Jesus, Jesus grew up learning that those people are not our people Jesus grew up learning that they are different and thus to be avoided but Jesus isn't only a human being Jesus is God and God isn't going to let this mother leave here without being heard, seen, and responded to. What we need to hear this morning from this text is that Jesus fully knows how difficult it can be to ask and ask and ask for healing, ask for help, ask to be heard. Because Jesus met a woman who demonstrated absolute faith in God and had absolute love for her daughter. A woman who begged for her daughter to be made well and got the cold shoulder, but had faith anyway. I heard one person say it this way, that this woman receives God's no, but continues to believe in God's yes. This morning, we are invited to see that Matthew is telling us that faith and persistence are inseparable. It doesn't mean that if I haven't received healing in the ways that I wanted, that I'm not praying enough. It does not mean that God is waiting for me to pray a hundred times a day before my loved one will be made well. But what we see in the story of the Canaanite woman is that her faith does not allow anything to stop her from calling on the one named Jesus. Jesus, the Jewish rabbi from Nazareth. Jesus, the God of all of creation. And so today, we can follow this mother's example and persist in our faith despite how many no's we have received, despite how many times we fall down, despite how many bad reports we have gotten from the doctor, despite how many times we have felt like God might be giving me the cold shoulder because like this woman we can believe in God's yes even when all we have heard is no 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 God is faithful and Jesus is faithful and our faith persists because God will not leave us shouting and crying out for help God will respond no matter what, whether it's a gym bag or better days, we can persist and we can keep knocking on that door because God is responding. We don't always see how, when, and where, but we know that God will not leave us disappointed. We can believe in God's yes and persist and thrive because God will respond and bring healing, whether that be in this life or the next. God will not leave us to shout and cry out forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In response to the word proclaimed, that the Apostles' Creed is especially uh, important this morning as it affirms uh, one of the things we just talked about in the sermon, the aspect of Jesus as being fully a human, fully a man. And so let us think about that as we proclaim together our faith uniting in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning and welcome now to Children's Time. Uh, something I was thinking about with the text this week was I recently went to go visit uh, with my dad and, and when I went to go do that I got to my dad's house and he wasn't expecting me so I knocked on the door and 
and I don't know about your parents, but, but my dad has been working at home, and so he was on a, a conference call with his job, and so he opened the door, and our little, my family's little dog was trying to run out, so he's trying to keep her in the house as well, and doesn't really look up, and doesn't know it's me, and so he says to me, is this important? Thinking I'm maybe somebody trying to sell something, or, or just bothering him on that day, uh, but I'm his, I'm his child, and I was there to spend some time with him. But he, he's not able to see me and says, uh, you know, is this important? And so I stand there a minute, a little confused. And finally, my dad looks up and realizes it's me. And, you know, oh, I'm sorry, opens the door, I come inside. I was thinking about that. It's happened a couple, maybe a couple of weeks ago. But I was thinking about that because in the passage, a woman comes up to Jesus and asks Jesus, to help her, her daughter is not well, and, and she wants Jesus to help her with that, but Jesus doesn't respond with help right away. But what the woman does in the passage is that she keeps asking, she keeps coming to Jesus, she keeps trying again and again for Jesus to respond to her, and at the end of the passage, Jesus does, and, and the daughter is, uh, in Matthew's words, made well. And so what I think we can learn from that is to see this woman's persistence in her faith and in what Jesus can do. And so this morning, what I thought would be helpful to share is that when we go to God in prayer, or when something's happening in our life that's difficult and it kind of keeps happening and it's not getting better, that we too can, can persist in believing that God is one with us, but also that God will respond. And God isn't waiting for us to pray a certain number of times before God will answer. But I think there's something to learn from this passage in seeing a woman who keeps going to Jesus again and again, coming right back every time Jesus doesn't respond with what she needs. And so like that, we too can bring all of our problems to Jesus and persist and keep going to Jesus and keep going to Jesus and I believe that we will be answered, that, we, that God will answer our prayer. We might not always know how that happens or how God does that, but God hears us and God does answer. And so this morning, if you are going through something difficult and it's been going on a while, I just hope that you hear in this story this morning that we too can keep going to Jesus again and again and believe just like this woman did that God will respond. And we see in the passage that God does. And so this morning, I believe, and I'm sure you do as well, that God is with us and that God will respond. And so hopefully your parents recognize you when you knock on your parents' door when you grow up. Uh, but we give my dad a hard time about that. Uh, but he did let me in the house uh, after I stood there a little while when he finally looked up. Uh, but you too uh, can hopefully this week Spend some time with God, go to God, even if we don't receive that answer the way we want to right away or the way we think we need it right away. Let us persist and have faith that God is with us and that God will respond. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we do thank you for these, your children. Lord, we pray for them as they enjoy their last week of summer vacation here in Newberry County. Lord, we just ask that you'll be with them in whatever capacity they will take on their school year. Lord, be with them, encourage them, help us to encourage them as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I invite you to join me in prayer this morning. Gracious and everlasting God, we give you thanks again this morning as you have united us in this online worship service, that Lord, your Holy Spirit is moving wherever we might be this morning, uniting us in your Son. And so this morning, we do give you thanks for that and ask God that you will continue to be with us as we seek more and more ways to reach out beyond ourselves, to share the good news of your Son with any and everyone in all kinds of formats, Lord. So we just thank you that you have called us and led us this far, uh, Lord, with this online worship service, and we pray, Lord, that it would indeed be glorifying to you and a worthy offering of praise and worship. Today, Lord, we do lift up uh, those students and teachers and school administrators and workers in the education system who are preparing to go back to school in the coming days. Lord, we ask that you will be with them, protect them. Lord, be with them and calm them as there is surely lots of anxiety around starting school back. 
Lord, be with those parents and children who have elected to participate in school virtually this year. Lord, help them to know that that is an acceptable and worthwhile decision to make. Lord, and we just ask that you would be with them. Lord, we'll pray very much today that for all the children, Lord, that they will receive the education in whatever way it comes to them this year. Lord, that they would receive it in the way, Lord, that they need it so they might grow in their learning and continue on in their career goals or the, the goals of growing and learning. We just pray, God, that you'd be with them today. Lord, also those who will start college this week, those who will uh, leave their mothers or fathers or whoever took care of them as children and will go off or go to the school in their own community, Lord. College is such a big change for many people, and we pray, God, especially during this time, that you will be with those who will go to school this week in higher education. Lord, we just pray, God, that you will continue to be with us in this summer vacation, this summer time in our lives, Lord. It might not be vacation for all of us, but God, it is a time, Lord, that we do take time for family and vacations and trips. And Lord, though those might have looked different this year or have been canceled time and again, Lord, we pray, God, that you have been with families and encourage them to take time together and to rest and, Lord, and seek fellowship with one another this summer. And so, Lord, we do thank you again for this worship service. We thank you for your son and the freedom offered in him for new life. Lord, for the forgiveness of sins. And, Lord, that you are indeed with us today. And so now, God, we ask that you would unite us with the churches across the world and with the saints in glory as we pray together the prayer you have taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as you go, I want to remind you that your strength must come from the Lord's mighty power within you. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand safe against all strategies and tricks of Satan. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.